don't do that to me. Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Blue, Chair of the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee, and I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, The Art of Scanning. This is the first of a very full and exciting schedule of webinars for 2011-2012. Our speaker this afternoon is Paul Royster, Coordinator of Scholarly Communications at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Paul has an extensive background in publishing and production and has been the manager of the University of Nebraska's Open Access Institutional Repository since 2005. He is a frequent speaker on a variety of topics related to IRs and has a great deal of experience with all aspects of institutional repository management. Paul will take questions at the conclusion of his presentation. Please use the question box on your screen to submit your questions. If there are more questions than Paul can answer within the time allotted, he will respond to them in writing and the answers will be made available to all attendees by email. The webinar is being recorded and all attendees will be sent a link to the recording and a copy of Paul's slides at the conclusion of the webinar. Now there may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Paul. Well, welcome everybody uh, to our webinar on the art of scanning. I'm Paul Royster and I'm speaking to you from Lincoln, Nebraska today where we have a hot summer day and the students are back. So we're all excited to see them. Today's topic is the art of scanning. Let me just tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, thank you, Pamela, for that nice introduction. I think she covered a lot of what I have to say. I've been six years as manager of our institutional repository here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. My previous career, I was a book production manager for scholarly and art books for the Library of America, for Yale University Press, and others. And that's where I first got my introduction into uh, scanning and uh, desktop uh, uh, layouts and the like. So I was able to bring some of that to our institutional repository um, table and, and to apply some of what I had learned in my misspent youth. Um, this presentation derives from work that we do in scanning materials to make PDF files for our institutional repository. And uh, uh, the approach assumes that you have a scanner and you have software to drive it, and also three software programs from Adobe. Uh, Adobe Acrobat, Adobe Photoshop, and Adobe InDesign. These are sold together as their creative suite. Uh, the commercial price for that is about $1,500. But there's a great bargain if you get the educational package. It's only about $250. Uh, there is a pamphlet version of this presentation that is online in our institutional repository. Uh, if you can't remember that link, you can also find it in a Google search. If you just Google the art of scanning, uh, you can even click the I'm feeling lucky because it's the first thing that comes up. Um, and let me just say, I wrote this up because every semester I was teaching our work study students. And I just got kind of bored about doing the same lessons over and over again, so I thought I'm going to write this up and share it with the world. Now I call it the art of scanning, and that's kind of presumptuous to call scanning an art. You really are just slapping it on there and punching a button, aren't you? But, but the craft of scanning doesn't sound nearly as sexy, so just bear with me and let's consider it for the time being as one of the fine arts like music or poetry or dance and every art has its muse, you know, there's errado is the muse of poetry and terpsichore is the muse of dance and euterpe is the muse of music. Well, recent research has revealed there was actually a tenth muse, Anna, Anna Gignoski, she was the muse of scanning. And note here she's seen on this attic face with her scanner and the lid is up. Uh, seriously though, I want to talk first about the scanner. This is no, should be no surprise that scanning does require a scanner, um, and, but an adequate one is, is really within the reach of just about everybody. They now often come as part of a multi-purpose copy scan fax machine and, and these can be uh, uh, often
often priced under $100. There are many models of scanners on the market. They will, almost all of them will do photographs, color, line artwork, and, and text with resolution up to 600 dpi, and that will meet most needs. Just to share with you, I use a Microtech scan maker i700, which cost under $300 when, when I bought it seven years ago, or the library bought it for me. It's now a discontinued model, so I don't think you can buy one unless you get it on the used market. But it's a nice thing, and it was not an expensive piece of equipment. How does a scanner work? Well, a scanner divides an image into a grid of small areas, which it calls dots. And the resolution or the fineness of the scan is expressed in dots per inch, or DPI. The scanner then bounces a laser beam off of each dot, and it writes down information about each dot from the reflection that it gets. It writes these in a digital file. Now, scanner software is going to vary according to the model of scanner that you have, and it generally comes with the scanner. Now, there are many makes of scanners. Probably the most common is HP. HP makes good scanners. They make terrible scanning software. So I'll just give you my opinion on that now. I, I, I stay away from HP because I don't like their software. But the software should enable you to control the settings. And the settings that you want to control are these seven that I've outlined here. I'm going to walk through them in order. First is the original media. What is it that's being scanned? Is it reflective? That is, is it opaque, like a sheet of paper or a page of a book? Is it transparent, something that you see through, like a slide? And this requires a scanner with a transparency adapter that allows you to shoot light down through it uh, and a supplemental light source, usually in the hood. Is it positive, that is, is it normal, or is it revert, negative, reversed? Like, like, and you can scan those things, too. They, they, they scan very well. Second is the scan area that you want to control. And that's the portion of the scanner bed that you're going to scan. You don't have to scan the whole bed each time. For high volume scanning, I find it's more efficient if you don't have to reset the scan area for each scan. You just turn the page, hit scan again. Here I've selected the top 11 inches of an 8.5 by 14 scanner bed. This is off my, this is what the scanner software on my scanner looks like. There are types of scans, and I'm going to talk about this a lot over the course of the next 45 minutes. The types of scans, there's line art, also known as bitmap, also known as black and white, sometimes even known as monochrome. Each dot, it's either 100% black or it's 100% white. There's no in-between. Second kind is called grayscale. Each dot is one of 256 shades of gray. Third kind is color, and RGB, which stands for red, green, blue. Each dot is expressed as a mixture of those colors, and this is the kind of color that's used on a color TV or a computer monitor. Fourth kind is color, CMYK color. There, each dot is expressed as a mixture of the four processed printing colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. This is used for printing, not so much for on-screen presentation. Now, line art looks like this. You know, it's either all black or it's all white. So usually it's graphs, or, but also it can be illustrations like this mastodon. But there's only two colors. It's either black or it's white. Grayscale. Here are some samples of grayscale. Yes, there's black and yes, there's white, but there's gray things in between. So uh, uh, there's gray and there's different shades of gray. So you have to preserve those in order to, to show the information that's in the illustration. The fourth thing that you should control with your scanner software is the resolution. How many dots per inch, and this is vertically as well as horizontally, will be recorded and reproduced in the file. Um, the recommended resolutions for various scan types, I recommend 300 dpi for grayscale and for color. Line art and text, 300 at the low end, 600 at the high end, and then sometimes you get things that are you know, they're a mixture. There's grayscale, but there's text on it. And for those, I find that 400 dpi is a good compromise. Well, why are we compromising? Well, because the other side of resolution is the file size. Resolution is directly related to the size of the file. So overscanning or scanning at too high a resolution can lead to unmanageably large files that are hard to manipulate, and they take too long to download. Now, rough typewriter style text is, is usually adequately reproduced at 300 dpi. But for smaller type and for you know curvier type, that does much better at 600 dpi. 
Here's a sample. The top one is 600 dpi, the bottom one is 300 dpi. Now these have been enlarged, you know, significantly, so I can show you the difference. The top is much smoother, the bottom is rougher. Now they're both readable, but the top one is, is much easier on the eyes, and it's a much better scan. So, you know, for, for typeface, uh, you know, that's, that's why I like 600 dpi if you can. Um, the next thing that you should be able to control on your scanner is the threshold, and this is used for line art. Now, the threshold is the point of darkness at which white changes over to black. If, that laser, if the laser finds something that's 49% black, that goes to white. If it's 51%, that goes to black. Now, normally 50% is the cutoff, but you can adjust the threshold, and sometimes you need to adjust the threshold. You, sometimes between 30% up to 75% to get an appropriate image. For example, in the top example, the threshold is too high, and the type is fading away. You're losing the thins, and it's getting holes in it. In the bottom sample, the threshold is too low, and you're getting every piece of dirt and every shadow, and the type is all too fat. That, that, that uh, threshold needs to be raised. Now, works that have been printed on coated paper, like art books, photography books, they tend to have a finer and lighter type, and they may need to have the threshold adjusted. Sixth thing you should control uh, with your scanner software is the output file type. What kind of file shell the scanner, save the scan as? Now, your choices are TIFF. TIFF is required for line art. Bitmap. That's your only choice. Uh, JPEG can be used for grayscale and color, and it's appropriate for those. The JPEG is really a compression formula that, that reduces the file size with some small cost in image quality, not much cost in the high, in, in the high quality settings. So, so I recommend using JPEG for, for images. And then text, if you're doing OCR scanning, that is optical character recognition scanning, which is scanning and converting to text in one, in one step, that's got to be a text file. Now, the last thing that, that, that your scanner should allow you to control is the file destination and the naming. One of the things that drives me nuts about HP scanner software is it automatically names your scan, scan001, and stashes it in some out-of-the-way folder, and then you have to look for it, and then it will not actually write any files uh, until you leave the scanning module. So if you crash, you're really you're out of luck. So good scanner software allows you to choose the location and will let you set up a naming structure. Many times it will automatically number each successive one, and this is very useful so that you can easily find and manipulate these files further as you need to. And this is vital for efficient high volume scanning. What is a good scan? I mean, and, and I, I, I have my standards, you know, what makes a prize pig? Well, I have my ideas of what a good scan is. I mean, the type is black and it's on a white background. The text is searchable, and it can be copied and pasted. The artwork, however, is grayscale or RGB color when that's appropriate, and it's without moiré effects. I'll talk a little bit more about those later. The pages are straight, and they're right side up. The pages are in the correct order. The pages are all the same size, and the final file size is reasonable. You know, usually 100K per page or less, so that a 20-page document is about 2 megabytes. Now, if there's a lot of art, you know, that's, that's maybe not possible, but in general, we do try and avoid file sizes over 100 megabytes. Now, here's an example of text scanned as grayscale versus text scanned as line art. Now, scanned as grayscale, you get dark gray on light gray, and it gives me a frowny face when I see it like that, because you're not only seeing that, you're also seeing the type on the backing page showing through the paper, and this is very distracting, and it's not at all easy to read. On the other hand, if there's a photo on that page, uh, that needs to be done as grayscale because that photo done as line art looks like mm, you're not sure you would like to meet that lady, whereas, you know, she's actually kind of cute. Um, and you think, well, okay, well, I'm sure that all the commercial guys, they know how to scan. Well, you, would, you might think that, but you would be wrong. Uh, this is a file I encountered on Academic Search Premier. It is a color uh, RGB scan, 
and it's 16 megs for a 29 page scan and you think oh well this is some old thing no this is done last year so uh, uh, you don't always find good scans um, the most straightforward type of scanning I'm going to talk about two types of scanning today one is scanning text or text in line art and the other is what you do when you've got grayscale photographs and things like that in it. So the first kind, text and line art, that's pretty simple and this is how we do it. Produces a clean file and a relatively small file uh, and one that meets my standard for what is a good scan. Um, text and line art can be scanned together. They're actually the same thing. Uh, and uh, uh, one scan per page is all that's required. We scan these as line art. We use Adobe Photoshop to crop them. We use Adobe Acrobat to assemble them, to run the optical character recognition, and to standardize the page sizes. This is appropriate for book chapters, journal articles, or entire books, uh, as long as they have no photos or color or grayscale artwork, you know, text, charts, graphs with black lines and areas. Now, with a little bit of practice and depending on the speed of the, of the scanner, my work study students have achieved rates of 100 pages an hour. Now, realistically, if you're doing an estimate for budgetary or planning purposes, I think you can think 50 pages an hour, and, and, and that's appropriate. Phase one is the scanning. You put the book on the scanner bed, and you use the top edge and the fore edge to align the book as straight as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect because it'll get corrected later, but it's it's easier if you, if you do it as straight as you can. You do an overview or a preview scan the first time. You select the scan area that's the full height of the book and the full width of the scanner bed, even though this may give you part of the previous or the following page. But you do this so that you don't have to reset the scan area for every page. You select the settings for line art, or some scanners call it bitmap, or some scanners call it black and white. You set the resolution at 600 dpi. If there's more than 40 or 50 pages, you may want to reduce that a little bit. Uh, but for most articles or chapters, you know, 600 dpi is, is, is good. You scan each page, you save the files as TIFF, and they will be fairly large, but they're going to reduce significantly down the road when we convert them to PDF. Now, my advice is review the first few pages by opening those files in Photoshop before you go scanning them all, just to make sure that your, that your threshold was at an appropriate level and you're getting you're getting a good image. Now this is a sample of the proper area for book scanning. Uh, using the entire width allows you to do the left hand and the right hand page without resetting the scan area. So I've set this to capture the height of the book and the full width of the of my scanner bin. Phase two, after you've done all those scans, you start Adobe Photoshop and you open each one of those TIFF file scans with Photoshop. You crop the image to the type block, and I'll show you it in, in just a second. You can use the selection rectangle or, and the keyboard shortcut. I know the keyboard shortcuts for these because I, I do it so much, so that's kind of how I think. It's all OP. And it's not necessary to crop to the exact edge of the type. You just want to get reasonably close, and you want to crop out all the shadow, the edges, and the other unwanted things. Now, if the page is short, like the last chapter, you want to crop to where the full page would end and not to where the type stops. And if a page sometimes, like in review sections or others, the page contains part of the previous article, which you don't want. Well, you crop to the normal page size, and then you go in and you delete that part you don't want by just selecting it and hitting delete, uh, rather, than, rather than cropping the page short. Here's an example of cropping to the type block. You want to include areas where type would normally appear, even if it's not appearing on that particular page. So, you know, this blue rectangle is where I would crop to for this. Um, cropping a short page, you want to include the full height of the page so that it will show up properly in the ensuing, uh, in the ensuing PDF file. You want to save this to a PDF file. There's a Save As function, Control-Shift-S, and you save a copy of it as a Photoshop PDF file. You'll notice the file size will go from several megabytes down to less than 100K. And interesting, the size of the PDF file is a function of how much black there is on the page. Uh, you know, a page that's full of type will be larger than a page that just has a few lines. It's interesting, regardless of the size of the page. Third phase uses Adobe Acrobat. 
we use Adobe Acrobat to combine these PDF files. And this can be done by opening the first one and then you use the document insert pages and you can insert all the following ones at the end of the document one at a time. Or if you lack the patience for that, Acrobat also has a combined files feature that allows you to drag all the PDF files into a new PDF file at once. And this is useful for longer articles. And this function is found under the file name. Now, after you do this, page through it to verify that all the pages are there and that they're in the correct way. This is what Acrobat's combined files box looks like. You know, you, you, uh, uh, it's under file, combined files, and then you get this box and you can drag those files from your folder where they're sitting into here and you can rearrange them if you need to. But if your naming convention was proper, they're going to show up in the right order and this will be, this will be easy and fast. After you get them all combined, you want to run the optical character recognition. And this command, it, they change what it's called in various versions of Acrobat. It's normally under the document menu, and you just want to be sure and select all pages. If the language that you're, of the article that you're working on is not English, and sometimes we have them in Spanish or French or whatever, you can edit the settings and select the proper language or the, the proper dictionary for that. Um, the Acrobat OCR program will also straighten any pages that were not completely square before. So, you know, don't worry if your scans are a little bit off. They're, they're going to get straightened up when, uh, uh, when you run the OCR. Now, what Acrobat produces is a hidden text string that sits behind the image of the scanned page. The typeface that you see remains whatever it was before. And if something is not recognized or misrecognized, only the hidden text is incorrect. And nobody can see this unless they copy and paste it to another venue. The real uh, copy of record is what you see, not the hidden text string. Then you want to crop, and it's under the crop menu, that's why I call it crop, to, to resize the pages. Now because all these, you know, you, you crop down, but, but they're, they're various different sizes. And, and you never get them cropped all the same size. So, so, so we use the crop pages command to set them all to a standard size. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I recommend choosing a size that's an inch and a half or two inches larger than the, than, than the text block that you have, uh, just to give you an appropriate margin. Now, odds are the original document was one of the standard sizes used in publishing. Six and an eight, nine and a quarter, seven by ten, eight by ten, eight and a half, eleven. Although if it's British, uh, all bets are off. You better measure it. This is what the crop screen looks like. It's found under the document crop pages menu. You want to set the sample page, set the page sizes here or here. Fixed will allow you to choose letter size if that's what you want. And you want to be sure and select all pages because this is something I like sometimes forget and then, oh, great, but you've only set it for one page. Um, now what Acrobat does, it places that scan right right in the middle of the new page size. So if we had cropped that short page to only be three inches tall, it's going to show up as the middle of the page, and that's going to look not right. So this is what it looks like if you crop that wrong. So that's why I want you to crop the full page, the full page height and not just where the type is. Then save the file. You're done. And you can delete all those single page tips and PDF files. So just to recap, we scan as line art at 600 dpi, we save as TIFF files. Then in Photoshop, we crop to the text block and we save as PDF. And then in Acrobat, we combine, we run the optical character recognition, we resize the pages, and we save the file. So that's easy. At least that's, you know, my students like those best. Um, but if all documents were just text and line art, uh, life would be simpler but less interesting. Um, and documents do have grayscale and color illustrations, and this involves some additional steps and the use of an additional software, which is the Adobe InDesign. Now this method, we scan the pages as line art, we delete the illustrations, then we scan the illustrations separately as grayscale or color, and then we recombine those two parts, the text and the illustrations, in a page layout program, and then we use that to generate the PDF pages. Now, Adobe InDesign comes as part of the Creative Suite package, along with Acrobat and Photoshop. 
Quark Express is a similar page layout program that could be used instead. If you are comfortable with that and you have it, you know, it's, it's basically the same, the same deal. Now, following is a step-by-step -step guide to this method. Phase one, scanning as we did before. You know, we scan all the pages as line art and we save them as tip files. And then we go back and we rescan the grayscale or the color images as grayscale or color at 300 dpi. Now we use the scanner's descreen function, or sometimes it's called the rescreen uh, setting, to prevent moiré patterns. And we save these files as JPEG. And don't worry about tight cropping these images at the scanning stage. You can, we're going to crop them properly when we, when we open them in Photoshop. Just be sure you get the whole image. Now I talked about moiré twice, so let me just say a little bit more about what that is. Moiré patterns occur when a repetitive structure like a printed halftone, which is made up of tiny little dots, is overlaid with another structure, such as a scanning grid, and the line elements are nearly but not exactly superimposed. So the image on the left, you see moiré patterns. The image on the right, they've been removed. Now, moiré patterns can be prevented by using the scanner's descreen function. If it's too late to prevent them, they can be removed with the, the filter in Photoshop called Gaussian Blur. So filter, blur, Gaussian Blur, and the range should be one or two pixels. So, yes, please help this poor South Dakota fireman. He's trapped in a moiré pattern, and he's attacked by moiré yields. Most people just call it moiré. Anyway, phase two, we use Photoshop. We open the TIFF files, and we crop to the type block. Now, if a page had no grayscale or color artwork, then we just save as Photoshop PDF, and it was like we were doing before. If a page has grayscale or color artwork, and we want to delete or erase this artwork, and we just leave a blank white space where it used to be. And we save these pages in their original TIFF format. Here's a sample of a formerly illustrated page that's had its illustration removed. Ooh, you got a crooked page. Well, here, if an illustrated page is noticeably crooked, you should straighten it, because we're going to recombine the type and the illustration, and that's going to be a lot easier if they're both straight, rather than trying to get them both equally crooked. So you, to straighten one of these pages of type, which is bitmap, and you can't rotate a bitmap, you've got to convert it to grayscale. You use the image mode, grayscale, or the keyboard shortcut. And then you rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise until a line of type all sits on the same guideline, which you can pull down from the top ruler bar. Rotation goes by degrees. One degree is a lot. Less than a tenth of a, a degree is not worth doing. So remember to reconvert that image back to line art or bitmap before saving it as TIFF. Here's an example. All right, this page is crooked. Now it doesn't have an illustration on it, so I wouldn't normally worry about straightening it. But I, this is just for the sake of illustration. Oops, for the sake of illustration. Come back here. Um, I would. Uh, uh, here we go. I would, up here is the ruler bar. If you don't see a ruler bar, then you want to go to View and select Ruler. You, you would uh, click on here and you draw down this blue line to the bottom of one line of type. And then you want to rotate. Here you want to choose Image, Rotate, Arbitrary, and until, until this side over here also sits on that line of type. Now this page needs to be rotated about a half of a degree, and that's a good, you know, a good way to start. And then you know it will it will be noticeably straight. Now next, after you've done all the text pages, you want to open the illustration JPEG files, and you want to straighten and crop them as needed. Sometimes you get in there and you you're trying to straighten the page, and you realize this wasn't straight to begin with, or it wasn't square. Yeah, that's that's a surprising thing, but, but sometimes it happens. When, you, when there's any doubt, straighten it so that the top is horizontal, because that's what your eye is going gonna, is gonna to rest on. Here's an example of a page that's crooked. You know, you can't have Honest Abe go out there being crooked. So again, you draw down that, 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 that blue horizontal guideline to the left side, and then you rotate until the right side is sitting on that line. So uh, 
Um, this image in particular needs to rotate about a quarter of a degree clockwise to be straight. And then you want to save these illustrations in their original JPEG format. Okay, that's the type. We straighten, illustrations ready. Now we go to Adobe InDesign to combine them. You're going to start InDesign and you want to open a new document file. It's under New Document. And then you see this dialog box. And you think, what the heck? Well, don't worry about most of it. Um, you know, the major thing is the page size. You want your page size to be larger than the type block that you crop down to, but smaller than the final page size you intend to wind up with. So now InDesign by default measures space in PICAs, but you can change that. You can go to Edit, Preference, Unit Measures. You can change it to inches if you're more comfortable with that. Facing pages, you can unselect that if you want. It's not really going to mess you up. Don't worry about the margins. You won't be setting any type. So these default margins of a half inch all the way around, that's fine. You can just leave them. The number of pages should be the number of pages that, with illustrations that you want to create here. Uh, if you get the wrong number in there, you can always add more pages to your file as you go along. That's not a, really an issue. The, using InDesign, you first place the text. And that's File, Place, or Control-D. And you place the TIFF file that contains the type on the InDesign page. Then you, uh, then you place the illustration and move it to the appropriate position. Here is the text page placed on an InDesign page. Now the, the red rectangle that you see just indicates the margins uh, and it's useful just to, to, to help you place the thing and more or less center it. Um, centered is good. If you make it so there's slightly larger outside and bottom margin than inside and top margin, then, then that's something that book designers go for. Now, having placed the text, then you put in the picture. And you move the picture over uh, uh, and place it in the right place. Now, the text, since it's a, since it's a line art thing, is going to be the, it, it's going to be on a transparent background. So actually, you know, if you, if you place the picture first and then put the text in, you can do that. But really, the text shows you where you should fit. You should fit the picture in relation to the text. So that's why we put the text in first. Then we export those pages to PDF. Now, there's new, multiple ways of going from InDesign to PDF. Export is one. You can also generate them via the print function or via the Adobe PDF presets, which is what I use. But you go from, from uh, 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 InDesign to, to PDF. And then back to our old friend Adobe Acrobat. We combine these PDF files either by taking the single page PDFs that, that only have text on them and inserting them one by one into the right place, or you can take that illustration illustrated pages file and you can you can extract all those as single pages and then use the combine function. Um, however you combine them, page through to verify that they're all there and that they're in the right order. Then you can run the optical character recognition, you know, just like before. It will straighten any pages that were not completely square. Use the crop pages command as before and save the file. And you can delete all those single page just to recap, for text plus photos, we use a scanner to scan all the pages as line art and save as TIFF. And then we go back and scan the photos as grayscale or color and save those as JPEG. We use Photoshop to crop and save all the text pages as PDF. We use it to erase the images and save the illustration page text as TIFF. And we use it to crop and straighten and resave the photos. We use InDesign to place the text and photos in the InDesign pages and save those as PDF. We use Adobe Acrobat to combine the pages, run the optical character recognition, set the page size, and save the final file. Now that's basically the two methods. I have a little bit more to say about some various issues that you might encounter, and then we can get around the questions. Here's one that is somewhat common. You do the scan and the shadow from the book gutter creeps into the type block. Some books are just bound so tightly or the type is set so close to the spine 
that the volume will not lie flat enough to properly scan the type that is closest to the gutter. We did this a lot on older journals that were bound with side stitching. Oh, it just drives me nuts. You know, you want to, want to take a razor and cut the stitching, but, but you don't because you work for the library. Um, there are two solutions to this that I have found. The easiest solution is to photocopy the page and scan the photocopy. Copy machines, they splash so much light on the page that the gutter shadow is usually reduced or eliminated. In especially problematic cases, you can be sure that the spine of the book is oriented at a right angle to the copier's light source so that it's spreading it all the way down the spine. Solution number two, if the one won't work, you can scan the page's grayscale at a high DPI and save that as a TIFF. Open it in Photoshop and then you convert it to bitmap. You may need to adjust the levels. Yeah, you may have to play with the image a good bit to, 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 to reduce the darkness of the gutter, gutter shadow and, 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 and to push it beneath the white-black threshold. When you convert it to bitmap, be sure you select the 50% threshold option and not one of the dither methods. And I'll talk about why I say that in just a minute. Here's another problem. The type closest to the gutter bends downward at the top and upward at the bottom. This is a result of the book not lying flat, and the distortion is created by the perspective. This can be cured using Photoshop. I mean, if you're, this one is not so bad, it's readable, depending upon the pressingness of circumstances, I might live with this, but sometimes it's worse than this, and sometimes you're just in the mood to, like, you want it to be, you want your pig to win the prize. How do you fix it? Well, you convert the bitmap image to grayscale in Photoshop, and that's done under, you know, that's in the image mode, and then you select it. Um, then you use the selection rectangle over here to select the part that's affected. Then you go to edit, and you select transform, skew, and these boxes appear. You pull the upper one up and the lower one down. You're stretching this, this edge of it out so that, and you change the square into a trapezoid so that the lines of type now become straight. Then you click over here on the selection rectangle and it will ask you to accept the transformation and you say yes. Then you convert the file back to bitmap and you're ready to go on your merry way. Ooh, here's another problem. The type has holes in it. This one drives me nuts. I call this the Swiss cheese effect or shotgun type. Uh, and how did, this, how did this happen? Well, this image was converted from grayscale to bitmap using one of the dither options instead of the appropriate 50% threshold. This is a way that, that, that Photoshop has of faking uh, a photographic image in, in, a, in, a, in a bitmap format. And it, you know, it's, but for type, it's not very good. So how do you prevent the Swiss cheese effect? Well, in the image mode bitmap command sequence, there's an edit button that brings up this little box. And in addition to controlling the resolution, you control the method. You want to be sure and get threshold, 50% threshold. And that's, you know, then it either goes to white or it goes to black. And not one of these that make fake half tones. Now, once you change the setting, it should stay the same unless somebody else changes it or Photoshop gets reinstalled, in which case you may have to go back and change it. Now, if you, if you fail to prevent it, you can also cure this effect. And the cure is, is, is the same as the cure for fixing type that was, that was scan, scanned with the threshold too high, where the, where the type has gotten faint. What you do is you convert it to a, to a 600 DPI grayscale, and you use the magic wand, which is this, this baby here that looks like a glowing a lollipop. And you select a black letter or a black area in a letter. And then, and so then it will select everything that, that's that color. It will select that whole letter. But then you also go up here and you go select similar, and then you come back and you go select modify and expand, and this allows you to expand the range that's been selected by one pixel. And then you can, can do edit, fill, and you can fill it with black, and that will fill in all those areas. And then you can convert it back to bitmap or line art. Now this is what it looks when you really zoom in. 
you know, that the dotted line shows this area that's been selected. And what we do is we fill that with black, and that makes for a, a, a stronger type, and it fills in all those holes or, or missing parts. And you get type that looks more like this. Now, it's not perfect, uh, but it's much stronger, and it's much more readable than type that's fading away or has a Swiss cheese in it. Here's another problem that you sometimes encounter. The image has horizontal lines in it, as you can see through here, uh, uh, from the type on the reverse page showing through the paper. Now, I've worked many hours trying to figure out a solution for this, and then one day I had the idea of, well, if everything behind it was all black, then you wouldn't have that contrast, and this is how I discovered the solution. You rescan the image with a black sheet of paper behind it, and you get out of that problem. Um, adjusting scanned images, you know, a common problem with grayscale or color images that you scan from printed materials is they're, they're too dark and they're too murky. And this can be addressed by adjusting the levels in Photoshop. Now, you can think of a grayscale image as a collection of pixels. Pixels are the screen equivalent of dots. Uh, with darkness ranging from 0 to 100%. Now, a scan uh, of a printed thing is usually going to catch pixels with between like 10 and 70%, rather than the optimal range of 0 to 100, so that, that that image gets compressed. For example, here is a picture. It's a Matthew Brady photograph, by the way. It's got a lot of black in it, as you can see, but it's not really black because it's got a lot of dark gray. Most of the pixels in the image, uh, uh, as I am um, show you, this little box here, or this graph here, is what's called a histogram. And a histogram shows the distribution of, of, of the pixels according to their degree of darkness. You will see that the majority of pixels here are in between 50% and 75%. Uh, and that's why everything is so murky. What we want to do is we want to grab the 100%. We want to grab the 100% uh, 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 control slider, and we want to move that over here till we just touch the the, the end of those. Now that's going to push everything else. So we're going to have to come back and catch the middle one and push it to the left. What that's going to do is that's going to stretch those pixels out over a greater range, and so the image will come back and it will look like this. You see where we've moved the sliders so that, that uh, uh, um, and the image, um, Father, hmm, I've forgotten his name now, but he's standing out from the background a little bit better. And, uh, uh, and he's going to reproduce better and, 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 and we've spread the range of, of effective pixels out more. Um, color images can also be adjusted. I, I hesitate to adjust RGB images. If I have to adjust color, I generally convert it to CMYK just because that's something that if you want it more blue, you add more blue. Uh, and RGB is a relational thing. But usually for color images, I recommend the Adobe Photoshop has a, set, has a function called variations. And you go there, and it looks like this. It will show you the effect of the, the various things you can do to it. So in this case, this uh, 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 Dr. Hoffman and his duck hunting uh, trophies. Um, you know, this was an old photograph. It needed some some color adjustment because over time, you know, the chemicals on a photographic print they they change. So this one, I, I, I for this one, I would select more cyan, and I would probably also select lighter. And uh, that would be the easy way, the easy way to fix coloring. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about are two tools that you may want to use if you want to just work on a particular little area of, a, of, of an image. Those are called dodge and burn. These, this is a holdover from the darkroom days. Uh, the dodge tool looks like a black lollipop. Um, the burn tool um, here looks like somebody making an OK sign with their thumb and forefinger. Uh, the dodge tool, you rub it over areas to make them lighter. The burn tool, you rub it over areas to make them darker. And you can also set the exposure, that is how much effect they take, 
and generally you'd want that set somewhere between 10 and 20 percent so that you're not uh, uh, you're not going too far. Um, this image on the left is unretouched. The image on the right, I have uh, a dodge that is made lighter. The highlights on the forehead, the neck, the cheeks, and the lace. And then I have burned the shadows. That is made them darker uh, uh, on the lace, the lips, the nose, and all, just to bring her out a little bit from the background. I could go on. But there is a time frame here. So what I'm thinking is this might be time for questions. Now I will see your questions in the question box. And I don't see any questions. Hi, Paul. This is Pamela. Um, I don't see any questions in the question box, but there is one now. And so okay. I, I'm also going to send you a question in the chat window. OK. Okay. So go um, ahead and, and answer. I'm sure more questions. Right, uh, I'll read the question first, right? The first question is, your workflow doesn't really work for our institution. Why hasn't your library purchased an overhead scanner? Well, um, actually our library does have some overhead scanners. They uh, are over in the uh, Center for Digital Humanities and in the uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, oh, special collections, rare books area. Um, I don't think that they get around the problem of the pages that have both grayscale and line art on them. Uh, and what they tend to do is extremely high resolution, huge files. I see the scans being made by some of the um, you know, the big projects, and they're talking terabytes and petabytes. And, uh, um, you know, I mean, if it, if it works for you, fine. I mean, I have access to very economical um, labor source, that is our work-study students. You know, the, the U.S. government pays 80% of them. Uh, and this produces um, uh, files that we're happy with in terms of size and, and quality. I, I, I see the, you know, the very high resolution, high quality scans that, that, that come out of some of these overhead scanners, but, but I don't know, think that they're necessarily appropriate for furnishing in PDF format uh, via an institutional repository. They take a lot of work whenever I get any to, to downsize them and make them, make them usable. Okay, now I see a ton of questions. Uh, can I expand this? No. Okay, next question. Do you recommend any free software such as GIMP, others? Well, I have tried GIMP, but I tell you, Adobe Photoshop is so widely used, and uh, it is such a wonderful uh, um, application, and the educational version is really, really cheap. And I have used GIMP, but I'm always trying to figure out, you know, I know how to do this in Photoshop. How does GIMP do it? Um, you know, I have used GIMP a little bit at home, but I'm always, I just find it very frustrating that I'm having to, to relearn. So I, I have nothing against it. And, and as, if they'll do the same thing, that's fine. It's just Photoshop is so widely, uh, uh, so widely distributed and, 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 and widely known. Okay, next question. It seems much of these problems you have created solutions for are avoidable with a proper scanner. Well, again, uh, you know, I, I, that's not really a question. Um, well, I don't know. Um, I would say, you know, I, I have encountered scanners that will scan directly to PDF. What my issue with the output of those is that the PDF file that they produce is a, a, a mixture of, of text and image. That is, it, it, it will produce a text file in uh, Times Roman that generally uh, attempts to recreate the page layout that you scanned. Anything that it doesn't recognize, it will put in as a picture. So you wind up with a page that looks kind of like a ransom note. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying that 
that's wrong or you know or I'm just talking about how how we do it given our given our resources have you ever used Omnipage I can't say that I have do you have a recommendation for a book scanner rather than flatbed no I don't I mean the ones I see seem to me to be horribly expensive and um, you know, much more so than needed, and and to be rather touchy, and to have proprietary software, and you know, I'm I'm um, um, I don't have a recommendation. I've seen some of them at conventions, but uh, I don't have a recommendation. Would you address ADA compliance? I'm afraid I can't do that. I'm not sure what that is. We had a book with very shiny pages. When we scanned them, we got shadows on the blank sections of the page. What settings should we be using to eliminate this? I would think that that's probably the threshold settings, and probably, um, you know, were you scanning it as line art? Um, this is, okay, next question. This is an effective method, but have you considered an automated way via specialized software? Um, no, I haven't, because this is something that I can teach my students over the course of about an hour or two, and then set them on their way and pay them $1.60 an hour, um, and get 100 pages an hour back. So to me, this is working. Uh, specialized software would take up more of my time. Okay, next question. For us, we would be spending far more on labor costs than getting a proper scanner. Well, you know, if, if your idea of a proper scanner and proper scans are what they are, then, then bully for you is, is what I can say. Next question. Sometimes we get requests from faculty for advice on best practices for scanning they are doing themselves. Have you distributed these instructions to such groups? If so, have you had any special questions from faculty not covered in this presentation? I've made this, uh, uh, this, this method or a write-up of this method available through our repository. Um, I find that it's useful. I can sit down with our work-study students. I can demonstrate it to them, and I can tell them to do it this way, and they do it this way. Um, I have not had that same experience with um, faculty or with departmental administrative person staff um, you know I can recommend it but they're going to do it the way they do it so um, okay next question it seems like your workflow has a lot of steps do you have any tips for speeding up the process mechanizing it again um, no I mean it's I've tried to explain all the ins and outs. As I say, it may seem a lot of steps, but I have students that do 100 pages an hour. Next question. Do you keep your TIFF files as high-resolution archive files? Answer, no. Um, you know, we have scanned a book off the shelf, um, so I'm not in the archiving business in that sense. Uh, and you can always take the PDF file that you created, and you can generate a TIFF file from that at 600 dp at the same uh, of highness of resolution. So, uh, no, I don't. Uh, that would be too much file space and too much file management for us. Next question. We purchased a book to net scanner. Once the scan is finished, is your suggestion that we still use the Adobe products you have discussed today? Um, I can't say I'm not familiar with that model. Um, you know, I would say if you find that you need them to create appropriate scans to combine various types of scans or to manipulate PDF files, that's really what those Adobe tools are for. Uh, next question. I am concerned with the time that this manual method takes, especially for high volume. Um, I'm, you know, I, 
I, I never promised that it would be, you know, I think a lot of, of scanning that produces bad scans is the result of people wanting a method where you push the button and you walk away. And, you know, I think that's the EBSCO scan that I showed you and many others. Uh, you know, there's no, um, there's no substitute for, um, you know, for the, the human hand and eye. I, uh, uh, you know, is, is there a labor-free way of doing this? I'm, I'm not promising it. Uh, next question. What kind of documents are you scanning and for what purpose? Mainly we're scanning book chapters, article, uh, uh, journal articles, uh, occasionally uh, uh, departmental reports, and the purpose is to put them into our institutional repository as PDF files. Um, next question. Why not scan documents straight into, PD into PDF into a single file instead of using Photoshop? Well, when I try that, I'm very unhappy with the results that I get. Uh, I don't get appropriate uh, uh, um, presentation of the various different parts of, uh, um, you know, the, the uh, um, I'm not happy with how the type looks. I'm not happy with how the uh, uh, grayscale illustrations look. When you av next question. When you average the pages per hour scanned at approximately 50 to 100, did that include the steps to clean up, resize, crop adjustments? Yes. If not, what would be the full? No, that, that includes everything. Next question. Do you have any experience with major scanner vendors such as Curtis, Seuchel, book to net etc.? No. Next question. Or eight is answered. No. Next question. These are great tips to try out. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, next question. Our current scanner creates multi-page TIFF files, but Photoshop opens only the first page. Do you have a solution other than manually splitting the TIFF files into separate pages? Um, mm, no. Um, no, I don't. Um, Next question. Could you speak briefly to the issue of high-speed batch scanning versus individual pages and the pros and cons of each? Well, if you have batch scanning that you think produces good scans uh, uh, um, according to uh, uh, your own uh, standards or the standards that, that, that I presented earlier, um, go for it. Uh, I have not found uh, scans that do that. I, I, you know, scans that I receive are, you know, either I'm not happy with the quality of some parts, or I'm not happy with the uh, uh, with the file sizes, uh, or, you know, or if I'm if I'm happy with them, yeah, I'm happy to use them. I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not trying to turn back the clock here. Next question: How would you handle a page full of photos, like a yearbook, where there will be a little text? Well, if possible, I would, you know, get all the photos as a rectangle and, and, and not try and do them, uh, uh, you know, if you have multiple photos, um, you know, not try and do them one by one by one, uh, if that's possible, and, 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 and the text is one batch, and the photos is one batch, um, you know, so you've got one file for the photos and one file for the text. Next question. How many pages works do you scan each year? Oh gosh. Uh, I would say probably pages. I have two work study students working 10 hours a week doing say 50 pages an hour. Um, you know that's a thousand pages a week. They work summer and also probably 50,000 pages a year, something in, on that order. Next question, what kinds of materials do you scan? That is, it seems like more of journal articles and general stack books rather than archival materials or manuscripts. Excuse me. Yes, that's true. Uh, we also do some archival materials, but it's generally departmental reports and the like, but uh, uh, mainly it's, it's printed materials. Yes. 
question. Could you speak briefly to the issue of high-speed batch scanning versus individual pages and the pros and cons of each? I don't think I have anything to add to what I've already said. But I mean, if you want to contact me off list, I would be happy to repeat it or maybe be more specific. Next question. Would you please explain why we are running OCR software after we have finalized the text photo scan? Well, um, because you want to make the text available to the end user. Uh, you do it at that stage um, because um, you know your text was a TIFF file because it was line art or bitmap, uh, and that that won't hold the text. So you've got to get it into Acrobat in order to hold the text, um, and you don't have it into Acrobat until you've combined it. Um, you know, and it also it, it straightens it at that point. Uh, next question. Ooh, I, I guess maybe this will be the last one. We thought this was a great presentation. Thank you. Oh, that wasn't really a question, but thank you. You're re you're welcome. Um, Paul, this is Pamela again. There are, I think, three more questions, and then we really will take the rest of them and respond in writing. Okay, three more. All right. Uh, next question: Are there different copyright that is more lenient regulations for an IR rather than? scanning for more widespread distribution. I think the copyright regulations are the same. There are some different permissions issues. Some publishers will permit a posting in an in a, uh, institutional repository of that institution's faculty, uh, um, you know, where they would not just, you know, permit general on the web posting of whatever. So, uh, uh, but that's a permissions issue rather than a copyright issue. Uh, next question, do you recommend additional procedures for scanning manuscripts and rare documents? Well, I think there, if you're thinking about archival and preservation scanning, um, you know, that's a different uh, kettle of fish. And there, I think, you know, they scan the, the fly leaf and they scan the book cover and they scan things at, at you know, color and very high res and they are uh, not necessarily concerned with furnishing them over the internet, which is our in the product, so I think it's a different kind of, of um, kind of scanning. So, yeah, I would I would I would say that that would be a different thing. I, I don't have any objections with what they're doing for the purposes that they're doing it. It doesn't always suit our purposes for online publication because they're they're you know the files are 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 are, are way too large for our uses generally. Uh, and then question, we are curious, is this scanning process part of a larger typesetting process or is typesetting an entirely different workflow? Typesetting is a different workflow. We do a certain amount of typesetting for works in our repository, but it's a different workflow. Um, and then last question, what about a searchable PDF file as opposed to OCR or is that the underlying methodology? Well, we're using the OCR to create a searchable PDF file. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, I just feel that for scholarly purposes and for putting it on the Internet and for, um, you know, searching, running the OCR is, is, is key, and uh, it just makes that, that, that file a lot more useful. I'm going to, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to cut off questions right there, uh, and uh, uh, I'm just going to let, uh, um, thank you, thank you very much. And Paul, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Pamela. Okay. Paul, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm going to uh, thank everybody and conclude now, and we'll we'll just end the end the uh, webinar. The Continuing Education Committee has developed a schedule of 16 webinars between now and the end of December. We have one more um, in the Institutional Repository series on November the 30th uh, with Dan Kipnis on promoting institutional repositories in the community. And next Wednesday on the 31st of August, Barbara Bushman and Regina Romano Reynolds will present the first of five webinars on RDA and throughout the late summer and fall there will also be sessions on a variety of other topics which we hope will pique your interest. 
complete details and registration information about all ELECT's continuing education offerings can be found on the ELECT's website. Today's presentation was recorded, and as I mentioned earlier, a link to the recording as well as a copy of Paul's slides will be sent to you shortly. You will also receive a brief survey about today's session. Please take a moment to respond. The ELECT's Continuing Education Committee values your comments and suggestions, and we also invite proposals for webinars. A proposal form is accessible from the ELECT's website. As we sign off, I would like to thank Eva Sorrell, Jane Rosario, and Yuan Lee for providing technical support for today's webinar, and Julie Reese in the ELECT's office for arranging the recording. And thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. We hope today's session was useful. We will send you uh, replies to any questions that we received that could not be answered on the air, and we look forward to welcoming you again to, at another ELECT's webinar for continuing education in the near future.